begin transmission. I am uh, very excited to talk to you today about arthropods, the, the most diverse group on this planet and a group that I've been studying for a very, very long time and I've been very excited to uh, relate to you. Uh, but I also want to talk for a minute about um, another thing that's been weighing on my mind and that's been our investigation into the death of uh, Dr. Mastronomer. The, the evidence has been growing and uh, the more analysis we've done, uh, if you remember there was um, uh, Master Sergeant Rush suspected some foul play and we analyzed um, this, this strange protein that we found in her body and we've, we've analyzed it some more and we've we figured out that it's, it's definitely not from um, Ascaris. So this is, but it did come from some natural source, as far as we can tell. It's not something your own body generated, and it's not something that would be synthetically derived around here. So um, we're pretty sure she was poisoned. And uh, Rush and I went and talked to the captain about it, and the captain seemed um, almost dismissive of it. You know, he's, uh, he's a good guy, but maybe he's just being overly cautious. Maybe he has something to hide, but regardless, he he didn't really um, uh, pay that much attention to us. So we have to generate some more evidence before we can we can get any kind of official formal investigation going. Um, so let me kind of summarize what I'm thinking at this point. Um, there's only ten of us, well nine of us, um, and so the the potential suspects are are quite narrow. Um, I'm clean. You know, I didn't. I didn't do it. I, I promise. Um, uh, Charlie, I trust Charlie, and maybe, maybe this is just a, a father's bias, but I don't think he could do something like this. Um, I've been wrong before, uh, though. So, but for now, I'm not really treat, treat, treating Charlie as a suspect, and I trust uh, Rush as well. It doesn't quite seem like a an intelligent move if you are a murderer to. Uh, be the one who discovers the the murder in the first place. So um, the three of us that leaves um, six other suspects and for now I'm treating everybody as a potential suspect um, From the captain to the botanist to Dave and Vector and all the other crew members So we'll, we'll just have to figure out if any of them had a motive opportunity and uh, did it. <laughs> that's that's how mysteries work. So that's that's what we'll, we'll be trying to do in uh, in future future transmissions. Because um, uh, it will be important to figure out if there's a, a murderer on board and and who that might be. But for now, let's talk let's talk about arthropods. Arthropods are some of my favorite animals to talk about. They're spectacularly diverse and uh, they they're full of. Um, intricate complexities and fascinating life history um, stories to tell. So I could talk about arthropods for uh, for a long, long time, and I would never run out of things to say because they are by far the most numerous organisms on Earth. And when we when we ask the question, what are arthropods? There are certain characteristics that we can use to distinguish them from all the other groups we talked about. So they are in clade Ectizoa. So similar to the nematomorphs, the, um, the nematodes, the indicophorans, and the tardigrades. But what separates them from these closely, um, uh, uh, closely related organisms is their jointed legs. So they have jointed um, appendages. This is what arthropod means, um, jointed feet. And these jointed appendages have allowed them to um, colonize an incredible diversity of habitats and um, specialize into um, a lot of different functions. So arthropods are different from other ectizoans primarily in their specialized appendages, their jointed legs. So uh, we know that the water bears and the velvet worms all had legs, but they, um, they weren't jointed. They were kind of extensions of their hydrostatic skeleton. So these are truly jointed legs and, and they help arthropods um, become so diverse. And when we look at arthropods, there are three primary lineages of arthropods. Um, these are subphyla. And we have the hexapods. These are the six-legged arthropods, like these cute little damselflies here, holding hands. 
But don't be deceived, damselflies are actually voracious predators and with the highest kill rate in the animal kingdom that we've studied so far. About 95% of their hunts are successful because they have an amazing ability to predict the flight pattern of their prey. They usually attack other flying insects and they're able to um, uh, intersect with their prey in at a future point in time in such a way that the prey doesn't see them coming. So they don't chase them down, they actually predict the flight pattern and then meet them. And this ends with about a 95% successful hunt rate, which is better than even the most apex mammalian predators that we've studied. So hexapodes are the, um, the insects and their, their similar relatives, um, six-legged arthropods. Another really important um, lineages are the lineages the um, the chelicerates, and in subphylum Chelicerata we have the scorpions and the spiders. This is an adorable jumping spider that you can see here, and with the with the kind of metallic, shiny, purpley, orangish thing. Those are its mandibles. It often, I mean, it's um, chelicerae. Sorry, They're, those are not mandibles. It's in subphylum Chelicerata. So those are Chelicerae, and they're brightly colored because they kind of um, are used for interspecific signaling about um, about toxicity. These are all venomous animals. So the Chelicerates are often are protected by um, their venom. And then we also have crustaceans. Uh, this is the Yeti crab found in one of the deepest parts of the ocean here. And uh, crustaceans are different from the hexapods in that they have many more appendages than just six. And they're different from the chelicerates in that they don't have chelicerae, they have mandibles instead. And they have two really long uh, pinchers on their front, front pair of legs. So um, hexapods, chelicerates, and crustaceans are the three primary lineages within phylum arthropoda. Um, arthropods are also tremendously diverse in size. So we have the, the giant um, crab here, which is over 10 feet from claw tip to claw tip. A tremendously intimidating creature if you should meet him alone in a dark and stormy night. But a lot of them are, are minuscule, tiny little creatures, smaller than even a pollen grain, as you can see here. So these are um, different kinds of mites in subphylum uh, Chelicerata. And we talked earlier about um, a microscopic parasitoid wasp that's about the same size in, as an amoeba. So some of these um, arthropods can be exceptionally small, but they still have an advanced um, uh, nervous system. They still have complex behavior. Some of them can fly. That microscopic wasp can fly. So uh, they're tremendously diverse in size and in um, life history patterns. If we look at the phylogenetics, we can see that each subphylum that I mentioned, um, and we'll add on the myriapods as well, the centipedes and millipedes, each of these subphylum are um, subphyla are pretty distinct on their own. We can we can group all the hexapods together and all the crustaceans together, but the relationships between them are um, are somewhat controversial. So as a whole, arthropoda is monophyletic based on the snap morphy of um, this chitinous exoskeleton with articulated appendages. So jointed legs and a chitinous exoskeleton. Um, ancestrally, they're supposed to have um, um, a one pair of antennae, although in the Chelis serrata lineage that has been lost, and in the crustacean lineages lineage, they also gain a second pair. And so the, the relationships here between the subphyla are, are fairly um, complex. In fact, if we look at hexapoda, and a sister group to that, which on this um, phylogeny is uh, Crustacea, each of the other subphyla, Myriapoda and Chelicerata, have also been proposed as sister to Hexapoda um, at one time or another based on different, different traits. So um, currently Crustacea and Hexapoda are considered to be sister to each other, but that is um, a little bit under debate and we'll talk about that a little bit um, more later. Arthropods are in incredibly important. We already know one very particularly uh, disturbing reason why they're um, important, and that's because they transmit parasites. So we talked about mosquitoes transmitting uh, as being vectors for a lot of filarial worms. Mosquitoes also transmit a host of viruses, 
and um, uh, on Earth they transmit uh, malaria. So this is a tremendously damaging species on its own, but a lot of arthropods, um, ticks and lice and bed bugs are all disease causing or disease carrying agents. They also destroy crops and food, um, you know, as we've been gardening, gardening here on this planet and start trying to start our own little um, agriculture. Um, insects, insect pests are um, destroying everything. They eat our tomatoes and our corn and our cucumbers and our um, even our fantastic little um, space beans. Um, they just eat everything. So they're damaging um, uh, medically, they're damaging agriculturally, and let's see, there are other ways that they're damaging. A lot, of, a lot of people think they're icky, so they're kind of damaging mentally, you know, emotional health. Particularly Dave struggles with um, with dealing with the, the abundant insect life on this planet. And I think some of us maybe do too when you think about centipedes and spiders. Um, there's, there's a mental toll that living on a planet filled with arthropods takes. So medically, agriculturally, and emotionally, these are uh, damaging organisms. But they're not just bad. There's a significant uh, positive component to our um, arthropods, uh, particularly in their relationship with other um, life forms. For example, pollination, um, flowering plants rely on uh, butterflies and bees and uh, beetles for their continued reproductive success. So we can't have flowers really without um, uh, insects, and in fact, one of the primary reasons flowers exist is as an attractive lures for their their pollinating insects. So there's a really tight mutualistic relationship between insect pollinators and the, the beautiful flowers that, that we enjoy. We also use them for food, and um, you know, I think it says something about our, our crew that as soon as we land on this planet, we just started tasting everything and trying everything out. But it turns out that these particularly chunky crustaceans, these lobsters, um, some of us really, really enjoy eating them. I haven't actually ever tasted it, um, not necessarily for any ethical reason. I've just never had the opportunity. But some, some of us find them delicious. I have tasted some uh, products, so rather than the, the bodies of the insects themselves or the crustaceans themselves, um, they often make things that are particularly pleasing to humans. So the, this particularly I'm thinking about honey that bees make. So bees uh, collect a tremendous amount of nectar and um, then they store all this energy in this very energy rich antibiotic filled um, preservative known as honey and this is what sustains the bees throughout their uh, their summer and then through the winter and honey is delicious it's it's uh, nutritious uh, comparatively speaking it's extremely rich in sugar so uh, energy rich uh, food source and if you give the honey bees enough space they'll just fill it all the way up with honey and you can um, they can survive and they'll feed you as well so they insects and some insects or arthropods in general i should say don't want to be insect bias even though insects are the are the coolest um, arthropods in general um, cause diseases they have negative impacts on human society but they have po really positive ecological benefits in the form of pollination they're positive in hu for humans in that we can eat them and they have a, a highly nutritious protein rich um, source of or they have, they're a um, efficient source of high protein foods and then they also produce some really delicious foods as well there are really six features of arthropods that I think have contributed to their incredible success. And by success, I'm, I'm meaning their diversity and numbers. So there, there, is just a, um, there are millions upon millions of these um, arthropods on Earth, and there are millions upon millions of different species. So it's not just a single species with a lot, and it's not just a lot of species with a few numbers. They're both they're diverse in both numbers and in individuals. So what makes them so successful compared to all the other life forms? Um, uh, vertebrates. Um, there are more species of um, myrmidons. These little um, the common name are ants. So this this little guy pictured here. There are more species of ants on the earth than there are um, vertebrates. 
and this is pretty uh, pretty fantastic. So pretty fantastic diversity. Um, so six traits will begin here with the, their versatile exoskeleton. And what you see here is a, a turtle head ant, turtle head myrmidon. And this is a particularly interesting um, creature who uses its head as a, a plug for its um, colony, for its first nest. And so normally they're wandering around collecting food, but when an invading force comes, they will, um, oh sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, but they will, you can see here that they have carved their nest hole, their entrance hole, to be almost the perfect shape of this strange little um, head that they have. And when they retreat into their hole, they just plug it up with their little heads and nothing can get inside, which is just fantastic. Now, if this was a soft exoskeleton, this defense would not be effective because you could just chew right through it. But their exoskeleton is uh, made of, of a um, a polysaccharide called chitin, and it's cross-linked with some other sclerotized proteins, and it makes um, and some lipids. And so, all in all, the exoskeleton is water-resistant and acid-resistant. Um, it, it keeps the keeps the arthropods safe and dry and warm. Um, it uh, negative aspect of it is that it weighs a lot. It's energy expensive to make, and so it kind of limits the size the arthropods can get. But for their size, they're incredibly strong and incredibly um, resistant to um, uh, death. So, you, know, you, can, you can drop an ant from a very high place and it will just kind of bounce and walk away. Their exoskeleton completely protects them. And you can see that here with a turtle-headed ant. Secondly, they have highly modified appendages. And we talked about this at the very beginning. Um, and here we see a millipede. And I want to point out here that we see lots of different segments. And we've seen segments on, on worms and each uh, on annelids. And each segment on an annelid has paired epidermal seti. So similarly to the annelids, these segments all have a pair of appendages. They're not steady, they're a lot more complex and um, modified than just a simple bristle like the annelids, but it's the same general idea where you have a segment and you have uh, an appendage attached to that segment. On the millipede, you can see here that there are actually two appendages coming from every segment. Um, and that's really one of the primary differences between millipedes and centipedes. Centipedes only have a single pair of appendages coming from um, their each individual body segment. I want to point out here that all these little legs on the millipede look almost identical. So it's essentially the same organism from the head down that nothing really changes. But in most arthropods, this is a little bit different and allows for highly modified appendages to um, exploit a lot of different resources. And how this happens is through a process called uh, tagmatization. And tagmata is, uh, was what happens uh, during development, from, during embryonic development um, of the arthropod, where these segments will actually fuse together and when the segments fuse together, they don't always lose their appendages. So if you have um, three segments with three pairs of appendages, if those three segments fuse to one, you don't lose the appendages. You now have um, three pairs of appendages on a single, um, single now segment, and then those appendages, are you have some extra appendages with which to um, modify. So that's a kind of a, a, a circuitous way of getting to, around to talking about the head of this millipede, because this head is a tagmatized um, segment, or they're tagmatized segments. So the head itself is, is probably five to 12 different segments that have been fused together. And when you look at the, the mouth parts, we see an incredible diversity of appendages that are specialized for um, maybe injecting venom or crunching or mashing or grabbing or filtering and they're all smashed together in a very tight um, Place so so we, we notice this with the, the crayfish too. That's probably um, an even better example because we can see all the different diversity um, So in summary the tagmata are fused segments and this allows individuals individual appendages within those few segments to specialize into diversity of functions 
Um, and so uh, a few more examples in spiders, we, we can have specialized appendages called palps that are used for drumming um, along the substrate for communicating or for signaling to other spiders. We can have in insects, highly modified legs. So in these tagmata, you have a lot of those extra appendages are lost and the ones that are left become um, highly modified for walking in the back and in the front in this praying mantis you have um, a raptorial forelegs so a raptor meaning thief these guys can reach out and grab and ambush their prey so they have raptorial forelegs um, we see other insects that are modified for burrowing and they have fossorial legs we have others for swimming we have others for jumping so saltational so um, we have all kinds of different modifications for the unique habitats and lifestyles that these arthropods um, have. If you're going to be an active jumper or flyer or swimmer, then you're gonna need, you're, you're gonna be expending a tremendous amount of energy. And most arthropods are um, highly energetic. They're active creatures. And this requires an, a really efficient respiratory system. So the third thing that makes, makes arthropods so successful is their, um, their respiratory system particularly in insects. This is called a tracheal system. And we can see here on this caterpillar, we see uh, rows of black dots. We're gonna ignore those. And instead we're gonna look at, in between the black dots, there is a, a row right in the middle of white ovals. Those white ovals are called spiracles. And spiracles are the opening to their tracheal system. So insects don't breathe through their mouth or through their butts like uh, spoonworms, they breathe through their sides. And so these spiracles <clears throat> um, carry oxygen directly to um, sometimes individual cells in the body. And so they don't have a, a circulatory system that's like humans do that's going to um, transport the oxygen to the cells via red blood cells. They're just gonna take the oxygen directly to it, skip, skip all the circulation system. Here is a beetle larva, a grub, and this is uh, kind of a better picture because here you can see the little brown uh, dots there. Those are the spiracles. And then you can see this little net like, um, kind of like rivers of white flowing out of those. Though that is the tracheal system. So those are little tubes that are, that are connecting the outside oxygen to the internal organs directly without the need of a circulatory system. Uh, this is a, it's, a, it's a really, really remarkable system, and we'll talk about it more when we, we talk about insects specifically, but it allows um, incredibly efficient transfer of oxygen to um, cells, and um, at the same time, though, it restricts the size that they can be because the tracheal system um, won't, won't work if it gets too large. So both the tracheal system and the, exos the weight and cost of the exoskeleton restrict arthropods to being fairly small organisms, but very active small organisms. Aquatic arthropods like this, uh, this um, attractive looking, what is this? Uh, stonefly larva, yeah, this is, this, is a, this is a stonefly larva. So this is an aquatic insect and um, in aquatic arthropods, you're not gonna use a tracheal system because you would just drown. Uh, the water would just pour through your um, trachea and you would just drown. Instead, what are you gonna have? You're gonna have gills. And these gills are gonna uh, usually be at the base of the legs. You can see at the base of each of these segments where the legs join, you can see kind of a fluffy, highly branched thing. Those are the gills. And so aquatic <clears throat> arthropods are gonna have gills, terrestrial ones are gonna have some kind of tracheal system. Another thing that makes arthropods successful is their um, highly complex sensory systems. So this is a moth and wh why, why does it, why is it the way that it is? Um, why does it have antennae that are so highly branched we looked at gills and we know why gills are flat and leaf-like and highly vascularized. Um, we know it's to increase surface area for um, filtering oxygen and getting rid of carbon dioxide through diffusion. So this is the same type of idea, except not with oxygen and carbon dioxide, instead with little tiny molecules in the air. And these little molecules are called pheromones. 
So insects are incredibly sensitive to chemical cues in the environment. We're talking parts per million or parts per billion, sometimes in some moths, parts per trillion. And so these moths will communicate to each other about um, sexual receptivity or um, uh, maturing or in, um, you know, stink bugs can communicate chemically about um, uh, them being bitter tasting or they can also emit a signal that an aggregation chemical, an aggregation pheromone that says, I found a good place to eat, come everybody join me. And so they don't have language uh, per se with voices and words, but they can communicate um, the basic needs. You know, I, um, I wanna have sex, I wanna eat, this is safe, I'm dangerous. They can communicate all that stuff by smell. And so they have highly complex um, chemical um, uh, sensory cells for detecting it and then also for em emitting it. Also, they uh, have quite elaborate eyesight in some. So this is a chelicerate. This is a jumping spider. Spiders have eight eyes, eight compound eyes, and these compound eyes can be incredibly um, acute in some species. Jumping spiders in particular are active predators and they can jump long distances compared to their body size <clears throat> and um, some researchers have said that the, um, they can actually identify distinguish different people from each other so um, o over time they'll they'll be able to identify a certain face and associate that with food versus um, training or research or something else so they're they're incredibly intelligent and incredibly adaptive um, as well and that leads me to the fifth thing that makes arthropods so successful is their complex behaviors, incredibly complex behaviors. And I'm gonna talk about two different kind of classes of behavior. This first one is innate behavior. The primary <clears throat> behavior of arthropods is innate, meaning it's a kind of genetically pre-programmed, hardwired into it. This is a spider weaving a, um, a web and her parents didn't tell her how to do it, neither did um, her teachers. She just knows how to do it intrinsically. It's, a, it's, an, it's an innate property of her. She doesn't have to, to learn this. And yet, some spiders have, seven, have the ability to weave 17 different kinds of web depending on um, the context, depending on the purpose. So you have sticky webs and anchor webs. You have... Um, really strong sturdy threads and um, small webs. You have a different web for weaving an egg case and you have a different uh, different web for defense or for making a house to live in. And you can combine these different webs um, to make different structures. So um, nobody teaches them how to do this. It's something that's innate to them. Spider silk is famous for it being um, strong, stronger than steel, and yet it's not actually the strongest silk in nature um, that belongs to the web spinning insects like this cute little creature here this is a web spinner and web spinners live in um, they make these highly complex webs and they live in subsocial groups so they all live in this uh, this they kind of make this their own little cave system out of out of webbing and the webs don't come out of their butts like in spiders they come out of their front tarsi their their little paws that you see their elongated pads on their front legs those are contain um, a whole bunch of specialized silk glands and they they wave them around in like a circular motion and spew uh, silk from them which is pretty remarkable and this silk is the strongest silk in the in that that we've that we've ever discovered stronger even than spider silk and again no one teaches them how to do this they just they just know to do it innately Another really interesting innate behavior is um, that found in potter wasps or mason wasps and or mud daubers. Uh, there's lots of different wasps that will go out and find mud and mix it with some saliva and then craft this, this intricate, uh, well it's not that intricate, but it's better than I could make. It's a little clay pot out of saliva and mud and inside this clay pot, what are they doing? They're making a little home for their adorable little wasp babies um, to be born. And, but wasp babies need some food and these aren't mammals, so they're not gonna get uh, milk from their mothers. Instead, their mother provisions them with paralyzed living caterpillars in most species. 
And so they go, the, the mothers will, will go out and find caterpillars. They'll paralyze them with a paralyzing venom. And then they'll, they'll drag them back and stuff this container full of paralyzed caterpillars and then lay a single egg at the, at the roof of it. When the egg hatches, then the larva descends and just munches away at all the paralyzed but still living caterpillars. Which is, uh, which is which is pretty horrific. Can you imagine being being a caterpillar, and this gigantic monster just comes from the sky, descends from the sky, stabs you, and you get become paralyzed, and so you can still presumably think and uh, feel emotionally, um, as much as caterpillars <laughs> have emotions, um, and then you get carried away and locked into a dark chamber with a whole bunch of other caterpillars. And then all you hear in this darkness is just the munch, crunch, crunch, munch of the wasp larva eating your fellow prisoners in the darkness until it's your turn. Um, so that's, that's, uh, that's, why was I telling that story? Um, oh, um, because, because it's cool and also because um, some researcher um, decided to figure out if this sequence where the wasp um, grabs a caterpillar and puts it in the in the um, clay pot and then closes it up, if this is an innate behavior or if this is learned, if, if the wasp kind of knows what it's doing. So he waited until the, the female wasp grabbed a caterpillar and put it in the nest and then he interrupted her. He took her away and took the caterpillar out and um, uh, didn't let her close up the, the roof of it. And what he found was that instead of um, grabbing the caterpillar, stuffing it back in, and closing it back up, she would often start making a whole new clay pot. And it wasn't because it was contaminated or something, it was just because the, the sequence of behavior, you have to make the pot, you have to get the caterpillars, you have to close, the, lay an egg, you have to close the pot. And if any time in that sequence the, the researcher interrupted her, she had to start over from scratch. She couldn't pick, pick up in the middle anywhere. So this seems to be a behavior that's just hardwired from beginning to end. Um, this is just what you're supposed to do. In contrast to this um, relatively simple method of behavior, there are also um, some insects, uh, some arthropods that can um, exhibit learned behavior. So learned behavior is, you know, throughout the course of their life, they learn to associate things um, with things. And um, so one thing to think about is why would insects, why would learning not be that important for insects? And the answer there would be that insects are short lived, right? How much are you, or is it really important for you to learn if you're only going to live for two weeks? Um, but some insects, especially in longer lived ones, can exhibit some pretty remarkable learning behavior. So um, specifically associative learning, which is learning to associate a certain stimulus with another. So some researchers took these caterpillars and um, trained them to associate a certain smell with an electric impulse. So they'd release this chemical smell and then zap the, the caterpillars with a, with a slight electric shock. And what they learned over, the, over time is whenever the, they associated this shock with the smell. So whenever you could release the smell and then they would automatically instinctually curl up as if they had been shocked in anticipation of being shocked. So this is called associative learning where you learn to associate a certain stimulus with another. You can also, oh, before I get to bumblebees, <clears throat> um, so that's fairly simple kinds of kind of learning, but what if I told you that this, that the memories persist through metamorphosis. So we're familiar with caterpillars turning into butterflies. Well, if you, uh, in the middle of metamorphosis, what happens is um, in the cocoon, the entire little caterpillar disintegrates. It dissolves into this goopy, mushy nothingness. There aren't legs and um, skin and heads. Um, there is just this goopy mass of nothing. The only thing that persists are these little things called imaginal disks, which are little clusters of nerves. Um, but what happens is that if you, if you train a caterpillar to learn associatively, then through metamorphosis, after it dissolves its whole body and reconstituted as a, as a beautiful butterfly, it still retains the memories of its caterpillar life. And, and the butterfly 
will exhibit the, the associative behavior that the caterpillar did. Even crazier is that if you teach a certain caterpillar to, um, um, to avoid a certain uh, chemical based on electric shocks, and it grows up, retains those memories in its adult form, and then that adult form lays eggs and gives birth to a whole new generation of caterpillars who have themselves never experienced the smell and the electrical shock, those caterpillars respond negatively to that smell. They respond as if they had been shocked. So this is called transgenerational learning, um, tra transgenerational memory. And uh, it means that the, basically the, the memory of your ancestors is present in your body, which is kind of a mystical way of saying it. But uh, what's happening is that the, 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 the learning is physically changing the DNA of the, of the parents, and that change is passed down to its offspring, which is re remarkable. A long time ago, we talked about Lamarckian evolution and how um, he proposed that traits that the parent acquired during its life would be passed down to its descendants. And then Darwin came along with natural selection and a whole lot of other people came along and said, that's, uh, that's nonsense. Um, well, it turns out that actually sometimes that, that works if you, if you think about it um, in, in this way of transgenerational learning or memory. The traits, um, the, the DNA actually changes in the parents and that change gets passed on to their offspring. Um, so fascinating, fascinating stuff. Also, bumblebees are fascinating creatures and they're little adorable bumblebees. And um, FYI, if you ever go out early in the morning when it's still relatively cold, the bumblebees will often be found um, uh, on the underside of flowers just hanging out. And before they're warmed up, they're really docile. And so you can kind of uh, pet them and they'll often raise their hand up and you can give them a little high five. It's pretty, pretty cute. But bumblebees are some of the most intelligent insects on the planet, and they've exhibited a whole lot of complex behavior. I'll just tell you about one, and this is not associative learning, it's observational learning. So they trained some bees to um, pull a rope to get a sugar reward, and they've trained other bees to associate certain colors with a sugar reward. And so those, those bees um, associatively learn these things. They learn when I pull this little thread, I get a sugar reward. Or when I go to the color blue, I get a sugar reward, for example. Well, they did these experiments and had bees watch them do the experiments. So they had bees, little, little observer bees behind this glass watching other bees um, do these behaviors. The observing bees were then tested using the same type of experiment, and the observers um, did what they were observing. So they observed bees pulling thread and going to blue and getting a sugar reward, and they did that uh, too without training, which is just remarkable, right? This this is this is high highly complex learning, um, and it's it's uh, most people will not attribute this to insects. They we think they're just kind of little. Um, fuzzy, crunchy robots, but they, they have some incredibly complex behavior and learning uh, capabilities. All right, um, I could talk about learning in insects for a long time, um, but I want to talk about the last thing that makes arthropods really successful is metamorphosis. And metamorphosis, you guys know this from <clears throat> elementary school, it's the transformation of one organism developmentally to a completely separate organism. Here you can see the caterpillar forming a chrysalis and then transforming into this glorious adult butterfly. Uh, well, it's not just butterflies that do that. Um, a lot of insects do that. Bees and flies um, do that as well. And uh, this metamorphosis, what is, what is the good thing about this? Why, um, why is this? Well, first of all, it's, re it's remarkable, right? That you have the same genes present in the caterpillar and the butterfly. Uh, but you get two completely different organisms, um, which is which is just astounding to me, that you can have the same genes produce that creepy crawly um, caterpillar, and then this flighted antennaed uh, proboscis nectar drinking um, adult butterfly. It's just it's just phenomenal. Um, we don't really know why metamorphosis exists. Some thoughts are that it helps um, reduce. Um, intra-specific competition for food. So if the caterpillars eat something different than the adults, then the adults aren't 
um, competing with the offspring for the same food. So it would be like if <laughs> if humans only ate <laughs> if uh, <laughs> no if humans only ate mashed up baby food, then there would be a competition between the adults and the babies for the baby food. And it's much better for babies to eat baby food or milk, I guess would, would have been a better better analogy, um, than the adults who can eat solid food. Um, so anyway, the, the, the point being that the, 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 the larvae eat a different food, they occupy a different ecological niche, a different habitat than the adults, and so you're not overwhelming a single resource, whether that's um, uh, space or uh, food with individuals. So maybe it, it allows things to become more abundant in an ecosystem. Uh, the con of that is is the same though, right? If you have to, if you have to have two different habitats and two different food sources, then you're twice as likely to be short on one or the other. And if you're if you're short on one or the other, then your population um, uh, deteriorates anyway. So there's pros and cons to metamorphosis, and it's it's uh, still a pretty consistent mystery why things do this. But you guys know, if you can put this in context, think about metamorphosis, um, most organisms metamorphose. So we, um, you think about jellyfish and platyhelminthes and mollusks, they all have different immature forms than their adult forms. So this, this, is, a, this is a very, very common life strategy um, in nature. And like I said, it's just not just caterpillars to butterflies, beetles do this too. This, this just exquisite little uh, little little creature is the will eventually transform into this exquisite little creature, um, a tiger beetle. These maggots will transform into these uh, beautiful hedgehog flies, and so uh, the the immature forms are just completely different than the mature forms. This is metamorphosis. So those six things um, that would make a good essay question: What makes arthropods so successful? Their classification, um, we've got, I've already mentioned this, but we have three primary phyla, the chela serrata, the crustacea, and the hexapoda. We'll talk about the crustacea first because the, the practical is coming up and we wanna, we wanna cover that before the practical. I didn't talk about subphylum trilobita very much because they're, uh, they're interesting, but they're only a few species. And um, yeah, there's also subphylum Myriapoda that I didn't even list here, um, which is which is unfortunate. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, centipedes and millipedes. I value you, uh, but I just forgot to list you. So um, we will talk about all of those things. Uh, what kind of creature do you think this is pictured here? If you said ant or you said myrmidon, you would be uh, justified because it looks like that, but you would be wrong. Uh, because look at those long antennae and look at those chunky little thighs. This is not an ant. This is a grasshopper uh, grasshopper larva. So an immature little grasshopper nymph. And why would it mimic an ant? Because ants are notoriously bitey, pinchy venom things. So um, a whole host of arthropods mimic ants, and it's one of my favorite things to study is mimicry in, in insects, and there's a whole whole lot of them that, that, that mimic ants, just like this little grasshopper is doing. I want to talk about the relationships between these subphyla briefly here. There are two kind of different ways to group them, and you can group them uh, as sister groups based on the, the their appendages being uniramus or biramus. So if this is your distinguishing character, then you have, and let's, let's think about hexapods and then their sister group. So if um, uniramus versus biramus is your distinguishing feature, and hexapods are uniramus, and chelicerates are uniramus, so chelicerates and hexapods would be sister. Crustaceans are biramus, and what, what this means, uni versus bi, this just refers to the the amount of branches on their appendage. So both spiders and insects only have a single branch on each appendage, whereas crustaceans have two. So crustaceans are biramus. You can see that with the, the uropod, the swimmerette, and the uh, third maxilliped. 
there you have two little branches to um, to the appendage. So if we use uniramus versus biramus, crustaceans are off by themselves and chelicerates and hexapods are sister. On the other hand, if we use chelicerae versus mandibles, um, the crustaceans and the hexapods are united by their um, synapomorphy of mandibles and the chelicerates are off on their own. So the chelicerates, um, I've talked about this earlier, but these are the kind of hollow tipped fangs um, in spiders that they use to inject venom in their prey. Uh, both chelicerae and mandibles are um, lateral, laterally opposed mouth parts, they're, uh, but they're used for different things. Mandibles are for crunching, grabbing, and chelicerae are for stabbing and injecting venom. So uh, mandibles belong um, in Crustacea and Hexapoda, and chelicerae belong in Chelicerata. So if this is your distinguishing character, then you would group the crustaceans and um, insects together, the hexapods together, and leave the chelicerates out in the cold. What kind of mouth bars does this guy have? Well, <clears throat> they're dorsoventrally opposed chelicerae that don't envenomate their prey. So this is an exception. These are strange creatures. We'll talk about them. They're in Chelicerata, but they, uh, their Chelicerae are different. Um, so yeah, so that's an overview of arthropods. Primarily kind of know the, the general classification and different reasons why you would group them uh, differently in different sister groups and be able to articulate with examples what makes arthropods so uh, successful, both in numbers and in diversity.